Okay, uh, what we are going to do with uh, Tuna today is just uh, briefly, very briefly, uh, to discuss uh, uh, our, uh, some of our findings, also some of our discussions related to the resilience thinking and how we can apply this uh, new notion, which is, as Mike has said, is uh, becoming a very a, a buzzword even uh, in the recent uh, years. So how we can just use this word within the context of the urban planning. So uh, the contents which we are going to just cover uh, in this presentation, so uh, we are going to discuss about the contemporary planning theory and practice. And uh, we are just uh, going to present some of our arguments about the need for a new theoretical approach and uh, as the uh, resilience thinking which is just adapted from the different disciplines, but how we can use as the people that are interested in space uh, can apply this term, and especially how we can use it within the planning context. We are going to just uh, make a brief introduction. And also, uh, in this project, we have been just uh, came up with this book. We have talked a lot of methodological issues, and in this methodological issues, one of the attributes of resilience is diversity. So it's a connected in that respect, diversity. So we are going to just discuss a little bit on that. And also, how all of this kind of discussions uh, mean for a case study. So uh, we are going to just introduce the Rotterdam case. And so uh, to give you more concrete <laughs> evidence about this kind of thinking uh, on a case study. So the background, okay, why we need the resilience thinking? So you see that uh, in the uh, very recent years there are uh, very many different things are going on and which becomes the basis of the resilience uh, idea in the planning field. And we know that uh, in the new liberal era, where the public policies, programs, and projects are becoming more uncoordinated, so the chaotic actions, fragmented policies, this is all uh, we see in, in the uh, also in the diversities project uh, arguments, and especially in terms of the planning. So uh, again, this is the widely debated issue that the uh, more opportunity-led approaches uh, uh, is the dominant uh, in the planning field. And also, uh, we increasingly see that uh, the distribution of the benefits of the social system and the economic system is mainly very unequal basis, which creates a kind of conflict and so increasing inequalities, as we have seen yesterday. So there are lots of places really uh, going on very <coughs> deprivation, whereas there are very uh, nice, luxurious, gated communities are appearing at the same time. So it's just taking hand in hand, uh, in the very close spaces, not very far from each other. So this kind of inequality became more observable. And also, uh, uh, again, this is the uh, argument that the public and private sector, public and private markets, so the boundaries are becoming more blurred. So some of the public institutions are just likely to behave like the private entrepreneurs. And so what is the, the classical public? The meaning of the classical public and the existing is really uh, debatable. So. What we mean about the public institutions, the public way of approach is not the same of the 1960s or not even 1970s. And uh, plus we have the increasing disturbances and pressures. And uh, as uh, we know and also we have argued uh, in the project, there is a uh, the, uh, crisis period, economic crisis periods or uh, the, uh, the uh, really uh, where the uh, fiscal measures and uh, also the financial uh, issues are becoming more and more deeply affecting to the economic and social life. So the economic crisis, uh, 
Plus, obviously, we know that increasing ecological crisis at the same time. So this is the background and which defines the need for a resilient system. So uh, we can say that uh, the existing systems are more open to the unforeseen shocks. And so, uh, for example, a global economic crisis uh, just initiated in US economy, uh, just in a very short time period, it may affect people to the Turkish economy, although the Turkish economy, in the real sense, there is no problem, but a economy, the mortgage crisis in USA may end up with the economic crisis in Turkey. So more globalized world and more uh, interaction creating more unforeseen shocks. And also, uh, there is need for to define the interplay between the deterministic forces and the random events. And the random events are becoming more and more often so, which increases the unexpected nature of uh, some of the things that uh, we have not been un uh, foreseen uh, beforehand. So, uh, we argue that, okay, uh, there is need a new framework, and so this argument can be just extended in detail, but let me just uh, cut it uh, short. And here, the, in, in such a period, so the uh, concept of resilience became very attractive, and there are the different definitions of the resilience, and uh, as we know that the resilience concept is coming uh, from the ecological science, which is coming going back to the 1960s, and in physical science, so, but uh, it, it, it has became uh, very popular after the 1990s in the uh, in space uh, in special analysis and in economic analysis obviously it's even more recent so we see that there is increasing interest uh, coming up uh, especially after the year 2000 onwards so the different definitions as you see uh, from uh, the different perspectives this is coming from more in the ecological science, and here uh, we can say that the resilient cities are capable of withstanding sphere shock without either immediate chaos or permanent harm. So to protect itself, but protection is not the whole issue, so adapt to the new conditions, and even after this adaptation, can be benefit of the existing conditions to just go for a increasing growth or innovative uh, response to the existing system. And the Alberti's uh, definition is more or less the same, uh, to tolerate alteration before reorganizing around a new set of structural processes. So again, the, as you see, there is uh, the definitions coming from the social resilience and economic resilience. So here, the social reorganization and collective action, interaction of endogenous and exogenous economic processes, these are the key words that you can just see uh, in the literature. So here, uh, if you look to the existing literature, so. Uh, the uh, key to understand the resilience is just beginning with the disturbances. So the disturbance uh, that is coming in, it can be a kind of physical disturbance or a kind of disturbance, whatever it is. So this is external to the system. And so it's not something that is created with the endogenous uh, nature of the system, but it's coming external. And you have to just create a resilient framework, resilient system in order to cope with this kind of a disturbance uh, taking place. So, and uh, the ability of bounce back of this uh, the uh, disturbance is also very much uh, emphasized in the literature. The second concept, which we are also going to uh, just uh, discuss, is the adaptive capacity. So first, uh, the disturbance is important. The second is the adaptive capacity, the core notion of resilience. And 
Uh, as we said, uh, the capacity of a structure to withstand in an impact load without being permanently deformed. So that's the uh, main uh, uh, starting point. And also the capacity to, uh, of the system to absorb and tolerate disturbances. So in general, we can just define the adaptive capacity as uh, with these words. Then, uh, in, the, uh, in the detailed chapter, we uh, just uh, discuss about, okay, if we are, if the urban system is facing about a disturbance, if it uh, tries to create an adaptive capacity, so what should be the attributes of this adaptive capacity? So that's the resilience. And if you look to the literature again, so you see the uh, different characteristics of the resilient systems. As you see, redundancy, efficiency, autonomy, strength, integrity, balance, adaptability, collaboration. But also, there is the diversity. It's an important attribute of an urban system to face with the disturbances and create the adaptive capacity. So, in fact, the diversity is one of the core of these debates, and uh, we have also uh, just taken up in the uh, discussion the uh, planning uh, for the future. Uh, again, you know, this is uh, another uh, set of attributes. You see that uh, social capital, innovation, ecological uh, ecosystem services are added within this list. Or even you can have a, another set of the attributes, and um, recovery, connectivity, capital living, adaptability, robustness, flexibility, transformability. But here we have also the diversity as an attribute of the system. So, uh, and then taking this kind of a, a, a concept and how we can use it uh, in order to analyze and in order to bring with the new policies and the planning instruments for the system. So uh, our hypothesis and our claim is that uh, it's very useful because the existing government systems are not only depending on the uh, thinking of these endogenous capacities and the endogenous dynamics, but also when you just think about that, even in a neighborhood or a larger area, uh, you have to think of uh, the external forces and the external disturbances, and uh, so there are the benefits of the resilience thinking. So these are some of the notes, I don't want to go into them. And uh, so we will give the four headings uh, how the global economic changes affect the vulnerability of the urban systems. So very briefly we can say that first of all increasing the economic vulnerabilities in the neoliberal era. So the competitiveness bringing the non resilience uh, of the systems and so the global conditions, increase of employment uh, opportunities without the benefits for equal basis, and inclusionary process with increasing social cohesion or at the same time widening inequalities and the exclusion. So two different things are going on at the same basis. Mostly obviously the second is much more dominant than the inclusionary processes. Secondly, increasing environmental and special vulnerabilities due to changes in property markets is very important. And we have, uh, in the book, we have uh, just discussed in detail about the dualistic nature of the property rights regimes and what it means for the uh, uh, vulnerability of the urban systems. So more to the entrepreneurial logic. And the third, perhaps, uh, we don't have much time to discuss uh, this issue here, but uh, we uh, want to just emphasize the increasing democratic deficits and vulnerability in governance. And there are the increasing unequal power relations, 
although uh, in the diversity projects we tend to look to the positive sides of uh, what's going on, so in terms of the uh, regime, so there are also too many negative conditions that makes us to think of what we should do uh, as a, a in terms of policy and planning at the same time. So, and also the uh, impact of changes on increasingly vulnerable urban ecosystem and sustainable use of urban land, obviously uh, is becoming more important, perhaps it is much more important uh, in the world uh, in the recent decade. So, okay, uh, very briefly, if this is the case, if there are increasing disturbances, if the systems are becoming more vulnerable, so uh, the question uh, we want to raise here, are the existing planning systems in the past or existing are able to deal with this kind of uh, the unforeseen events and the external pressures that are on the agenda? So very briefly, uh, I want to discuss two uh, main uh, planning systems uh, and uh, go on with the criticism of the contemporary planning. And uh, okay, very briefly again, uh, the rational comprehensive planning, which, were, uh, which was dominant uh, uh, in the 50s, 60s, uh, so that's the main uh, type of approach. So, which is based on the instrumental rationality and uh, where the planning planner's role is to correct the market failures related to externalities, public goods, inequality, and transaction costs, etc. So, and try to just achieve the Valkyrie's type of distribution. Okay, uh, this rational comprehensive planning uh, is uh, what we argue in the, uh, in the book okay, uh, uh, is not enough to just define or to cope with the uh, increasing external uh, threats or external pressures because mainly it is more uh, not flexible, it is limited, it is uh, quite static, although it takes a, a longer time perspective in order to project what are the changes, but it is not dynamic to cope with the very uh, recent changes, very often, uh, the changes that are becoming more and more often. The second, uh, the communicative collaborative type of planning, uh, which uh, is based on the Habermasian, uh, uh, the rationality, the communicative rationality, is a recent, uh, if you go to the recent literature, there is a huge criticism taking place. Uh, collaboration uh, uh, is a very a nice keyword, but this planning system that has been just dominated in the uh, beginning from the 80s onwards, especially in the different parts of the world, are, is also not able to cope with the changing conditions. So because it's more focused on processes, but less the outcome, okay, the outcome, uh, and uh, it marginalized scientific information. It fails to acknowledge the influence of external forces. More to the internal forces are important. It neglects the power problems. Very short-sightedness. Okay, it's a, a big criticism, but still, okay, uh, just leave it uh, this. And, uh, and it favors some social groups and not uh, the others. So it's a kind of selective type of process. And so here uh, in the argumentation, we, see, uh, we just claim that there are two things that are important. So uh, uh, there is, uh, instead of the end state, in the positivist approach, and the contentlessness in the neoliberal th uh, theories, there is an alternate means of addressing the need for a more adaptive and reorganization capacity. So this should be the core of the debate in the planning. So adaptive and organizational capacity. So what this 
not only stay a change in the core, but a new, uh, it necessitates a new uh, way of thinking and planning. And he claimed that it's a, a alternative type of approach. And obviously, uh, we don't have much time to discuss the, uh, uh, the individual issues, but okay, perhaps this table is just uh, summarizing what we uh, are proposing. And here you see at the first column, the, the rational comprehensive planning is defined. And the, the second, the communicative collaborative planning is uh, given. And we think that there may be an alternative uh, uh, way of thinking, that's the resilience planning, which have the different concerns and the different focus. And then first of all, okay, let me just briefly discuss that issue. The, uh, the rationality uh, should be uh, just redefined. And here, instead of the instruments of the rationality or communicative rationality, we uh, just propose an integrated rationality. Okay, the debate is long, but uh, it's not only for the communication, but integration of the instrumental and uh, communicative rationality is needed. And the actors are not as individuals or technicians about the rational comprehensive planning or the individuals in interactive groups. Instead of we just uh, uh, propose the combination of the, for the technical knowledge and the technical uh, technicians and also social groups. But what is uh, perhaps the most uh, different than the others is not uh, going for the consensus generation. We need a commitment. Perhaps this is a key word of this a new type of attitude. So it's not only the definition, but you should be committed to do something, and the commitment is the key word. And it will be have a long-term perspective, but immediate action. And defining the most effective, the aim should be defining priorities and no regret situations. Perhaps uh, you're going to hear that uh, in the, uh, also the case study. So perhaps the uh, key word here is the no regret situations, um, which necessitates some kind of technical knowledge because uh, a long-term perspective but also to define some kind of a red tapes. So in the communicative action, because we don't have any uh, red tapes, but here you should have the minimum technical conditions, but before, uh, after this kind of the red tapes is open for the negotiation. So it's the kind of, uh, in order to just adapt the system for the long term, you need some kind of basic requirements. That's the essence of this kind of thinking. And more flexible type of solutions, as I said before, the context success is very much uh, based on the priorities, as we are going to see in the application of the methodology. So here, what is your priority is important. So, as a planner, we know that it's very difficult to solve everything, every other problems. But uh, we should have, first of all, to define two things. Where, is, uh, where the other system have the vulnerabilities? What is the most important vulnerability in the system? And the second, what's our priorities? Perhaps it's the core of the resilience thinking. And also, uh, perhaps we don't have much time, but we uh, claim that, we emphasize that the uh, new value system is uh, required. Because in the recent past, especially uh, beginning from the 1980s onwards, the value systems has been changed um, quite uh, substantially. And we need, uh, in order to just uh, be able to adapt to the new conditions and resist sometimes to the new conditions, we need uh, this kind of new value systems. And here, uh, which we uh, are going to emphasize, the basis of the evaluation of outputs within this kind of a thinking for resilience planning 
is the importance <coughs> of the resilience attributes. Okay, so uh, uh, these are really uh, uh, wave terms in a sense which we introduced, but okay, it may be clear about if we just put it in the real life sense, and which is the uh, how we proceed about this kind of thinking and putting it into practice. And here I put uh, a, a, an example from Istanbul, but also uh, Tuna will uh, just uh, talk about the Rotterdam experience. And you see that, for example, in the first column, you see that what is the real disturbance to the uh, urban systems of Istanbul? What are the uh, short and long-term disturbances that are taking place? So, and the second, what is the expected impact of this disturbance in the urban system? So we are not looking a report, but we are beginning from the disturbance and to look uh, to the urban system by looking from that kind of a perspective. And here, uh, in order to define the impact of these subsystems, we are using the indicators of vulnerability. And so the, among the, the indicators of vulnerability, as you see, uh, it, it changes from one case to another, but how we can be able to look whether the impact is important or not by using the, the different indicators. <laughs> and the third column, the fourth column, as you see, is we have another set of the indicators that's the adaptive capacity indicators. So one is, the indicators of the vulnerability and the other is just looking to the system and whether the uh, capacity indicators are there or not and analyzing <laughs> <laughs> okay you mean that I have to cut short <laughs> Okay, so uh, just a few words. So, uh, which means that uh, after that, uh, looking for the adaptive capacity indicators, uh, we look uh, for uh, so how the system is under the pressure and what are the things uh, we, according to the adaptive capacity and how we can improve the adaptive capacity in order to make the, uh, the system more resilient. So we have another set of indicators which uh, is looking uh, to the system and after that, in fact, what we say is if you just look uh, to this system to continue and adapt to the new conditions, so there is a minimum is there. So what you have to do, at least this, and uh, this uh, defines the, what we call the, uh, the minimum boundaries or the red tapes of the system. Okay, so uh, 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 the, after this methodology, so uh, we can go with the case study and uh, so uh, I leave the floor to Tuna about just uh, to talk about the case study and uh, also the Rotterdam case. Thank you very much. Um, okay, just a little briefly about our research and book. Uh, the research was funded by uh, IRANET uh, called Sustainable Land Use Policies for Resilient Cities, and the output after conducting research in four countries uh, was this book, Resilient Thinking in Urban Planning. Um, these are basically the case studies. We had Lisbon, uh, we had um, Oporto, Istanbul, Stockholm, and uh, Rotterdam at the end. And we looked at different uh, types of uh, resilient attributes uh, in these uh, cities. I'm going to briefly explain you how we approach the issue in, in Rotterdam and what uh, our main arguments were in the research we conducted in, in the Rotterdam case. Uh, basically, we noticed that there is a, a strong shift in the policies in Rotterdam uh, to aspire to control to change uh, towards increasing the adaptive capacity of the system to cope with 
adapt to or shape the change. And these were really highlighted in the policy documents and the interviews that we conducted uh, with the policy makers. So uh, in the Dutch system, while trying to reduce the risks with all kinds of technical um, uh, advancements, the urban systems try to prepare to absorb uh, those changes, reorganize themselves, and develop new adaptive, uh, adaptation strategies uh, basically to deal with all these vulnerabilities I will just uh, briefly uh, <coughs> summarize. Uh, but in our case, the vulnerabilities contain the ecological uh, problems that I'm going to talk in a minute, while sustaining the main basic functions of the city. So how we saw the adaptive governance system, we were really interested in the governance aspect of it. An adaptive governance system, we thought, uh, can be accomplished by equipping actors to deal uh, effectively with uh, sudden shocks, surprises and risks in such a way that after the disaster to happen, uh, the system can still continue to function. And of course, we had some literature in the background. So we conducted some discourse analysis, we did some interviews, and also we looked at different um, uh, analytical ways to approach resilience. Uh, as Foster described, there is uh, uh, two, two kinds of uh, resilience uh, aspects. Uh, preparation resilience and performance resilience. So you look at basically how the system can assess the vulnerabilities and how it can be ready for the disaster before the disaster happened. And then after the disaster happened, uh, then you can look at their performance resilience by looking at the response to the disaster by the prepared governance, uh, let's say, instruments, and then the recovery. And that's what we try to do. And, okay, I'm not an ecological scientist, it's, uh, it's not really my field, but uh, this is what we did, what we figured out. The biggest risk in Rotterdam at this moment is the climate change, because, of course, uh, basically, 60% of the Netherlands is located below the sea level, as we all know, and 70% of the gross national product is made out of this area. So basically, this is the largest risk that uh, the country is facing. Uh, basically, um, if the dikes and uh, all these other protective me measures that does not exist, basically more than half of the uh, country will be flooded. So flood risk is the major threat uh, for, from the climate change for the Netherlands. Uh, to give you some more scary figures, there are some real um, works that Delta Works uh, of the Dutch uh, uh, of the Netherlands made. Uh, they estimate that the sea level rise of basically between uh, 60 centimeters to 1.3 meters, basically about this high. Uh, will cause by the year 2100 uh, to, to flood uh, the entire uh, Randstad. And this is not uh, an estimation, this is the fact that we know by now. Basically, with a sea level rise of uh, 50 centimeters uh, sea level rise, about this high, uh, the storm surge barriers that we are very proud in the Netherlands will not suffice anymore. And increasing sea levels will also increase the water levels uh, under the rivers. So it's not only that the sea is going to flood towards the land, but also the, basically all the agricultural area will be flooded by the rivers. But, of course, we, are very, we have a very proud history to deal with, uh, with this threat because uh, by constructing waterways, dikes, earthworks, barriers to water, boulders uh, is part of the landscape of the Netherlands, uh, floods and uh, storms uh, over the centuries have been overcome with. And sometimes we also had disastrous consequences. This is the flood risk map of the Netherlands. Basically, as you can imagine, the darker uh, areas are the areas that are facing the highest risk of flood. So basically, it's more than, more than half of the country is under this threat. And these are the, basically the storm surge barriers, the mass uh, uh, land carrying storm surge barrier. This is the Osterskade carrying storm surge barrier that uh, twice a week I'm driving over. Um, these are really impressive uh, works, but they are not enough. They are not enough to protect the country basically from 2,000 hundreds further. 
So we have to think differently now. That's what the, the basically the data commissioner in our interview told us. Okay. So what we did, we looked at the resilience in local plants, <coughs> how it was perceived uh, by the policies, by the uh, 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 basically policy documents, uh, and it was basically everybody is aware of this situation, and they were referring to a lot of uh, aspects and attributes that we basically described in our project. For example, the sustainability guide for Rotterdam, we looked at hundreds of documents, so I'm not going to give you some, uh, some of them, but just one. Uh, they, they describe in this document uh, to look at, to minimize the probability of uh, flooding, so it's the technical uh, responsibility, but also to minimize the consequences of flooding and to stimulate recovery from the floods as quick as possible. And these are very interesting things because at every level, from the region to the building, they define certain activities. Minimizing the probability of the flood, minimizing the consequences, and then uh, stimulating the recovery. And also, the data commissioner told us that it's an opportunity for us that it's going to be, uh, the country is going to be flooded. So, because of course I was asking him, aren't you afraid of this picture? I mean, it's very scary. He said, no, we see it as an opportunity to live with water. And you can see, the, well, we have to think this way, right? It's very positive, positive thinking. Um, and this is just an example of a, a floating town. I work in a, a technical university, and our university has a lot of projects coming, like, for example, creating floating towns, floating infrastructures, that kind of real technical advances, basically to make people live with the water instead of preventing the storms. And also this I find also very interesting. So your house is located nearby, it's flooded, and then your house is <laughs> still <laughs> usable on the water. <laughs> These are all, okay, this is resilience, right? So I will just wrap up with uh, referring to two interesting aspects. Ida very nicely summarized the necessity for returning to substance, and she referred to flexibility and drag tape. These are kind of conflicting uh, concepts, perhaps. On the one hand, uh, an adaptive management system, a good governance system, should have the flexibility among the stakeholders to basically keep the system going. <coughs> On the other hand, the planning system has to be uh, a little bit bureaucratic, uh, has to have those basic red tape rules to keep the system running without the big risk. To wrapping up how to bring back substance, that was our conclusion, basically the uh, def definition of substance and capacity defined with the help of red tapes and priorities to deal with change is very important. We looked at those red tapes in the Dutch context. It's very complicated. It's a very it's a multi-actor governance structure, and there are many uh, layers included in the governance structure, um, and they are not always very well connected to each other, but there is a very certain red tape uh, bureaucracy that you could follow in each department, in each area that is dealing with the uh, water risk. Uh, another important thing is the critical analysis of the main processes and structural constraints shaping the urban areas, basically using the methods of instrumental, instrumental rationality a little bit. So being looking a little bit stiff to the structure is a little bit need, uh, needed. But on the other hand, we also need uh, an inclusive decision-making system that uh, covers different groups. Uh, I'm always always amazed in the Netherlands, uh, talking also to the policymakers, how open they are to invite in their big decision-making processes, different actors from private to national to local levels of government. I think I'll cut it here, and then I think perhaps we will go to some questions.